हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम डॉक्टर अंकित गोयल कंसल्टेंट साइकाइट्रिस्ट एंड नेशन वाइड फैकल्टी फॉर साइकाइट्री सो कंटिन्यूइंग विद आर प्रिपरेशन फॉर निमहान्स एग्जाम विच इज़ ऑन ट्वेंटी ऑफ अक्टूबर टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन वी नाउ प्रेजेंटिंग द निमहान्स प्रीवियस पेपर रिविजन पार्ट टू सो विल डिस्कस द प्रीवियस पेपर पैटर्न ऑफ टू थाउजेंड एटीन विद आर सीरीज एक्स्ट्रा कॉन्सेप्ट एंड टिप्स दैट इज हैश टैग ई सी टी सो लेट अस बिगिन विद द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन सो द क्वेश्चन फर्स्ट इज ऑल ऑफ द फॉलोइंग आर गुड प्रोग्नोस्टिक फैक्टर इन स्किज ऑफ रेनिया एक्सेप्ट ऑप्शन आर ए प्रेजेंस ऑफ मूड सिम्टम्स बी प्रोमिनेंट पॉजिटिव सिम्टम्स सी इंसीडियस ऑनसेट एंड डी मैरिड सो वी हैव टू टेल विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग इज नॉट अ गुड प्रोग्नोस्टिक फैक्टर सो द आंसर इज ऑप्शन सी दैट इज इंसीडियस ऑनसेट now let us discuss some of the important topic that is the prognostic factors in schizophrenia so the good prognostic factor is acute or abrupt onset what is onset what is onset is the time taken from a normal state to the abnormal state so acute onset means that the onset has occurred within few days or weeks while insidious onset that is the symptoms have had an onset from few months to years that is insidious onset is a poor prognostic factor again late onset of symptoms is again a good prognostic factor while early onset of symptom is a poor prognostic factor now the subtypes which subtype is a good prognostic factor and which is a poor prognostic factor so catatonic schizophrenia and paranoid schizophrenia are some of the good prognostic type of subtypes of schizophrenia while simple hebephrenic or disorganized and undifferentiated schizophrenia are poor prognostic factor again going on the gender so female gender has a good prognostic factor while male genders have a poor prognostic factor again prominent positive symptoms what are the positive symptoms that is delusions hallucinations these are the positive symptoms so if they are prominently present in the patient this is a good prognostic factor while prominent negative symptoms negative symptoms in the form of anhedonia evolution elogia asociality or affect flattening all these five negative symptoms are poor if they are prominently present in the patient it is a poor prognostic factor now presence of affective symptoms or mood symptoms so suppose a patient with schizophrenia is also showing some depressive symptoms or some manic symptoms so if they are present then it is considered to be a good prognostic factor this is a very very important point and many a times asked in the question while if such symptoms are absent it is a poor prognostic factor again very important to remember that a family history of a mood disorder is a good prognostic factor while a family history of schizophrenia is again a poor prognostic factor now person being married or having a good social support these are good prognostic factor while someone who is unmarried divorced widow or separated or has a poor social support are again poor prognostic factor pre morbid functioning so functioning of a person before the onset of illness so if it was good then we say that again a person has good prognostic factor in schizophrenia while a poor pre morbid functioning is again a poor prognostic factor so this is the list of some of the important prognostic factors in schizophrenia and very very important to remember for the exam now let us go to the next question a 42 year old male has persistent doubts since one year that his wife is having an affair although no one agrees with it these causes sadness and distress although otherwise he is able to do his work as before what is the diagnosis so the options are a schizoaffective disorder b delusional disorder c depression and d schizophrenia again a very important and clinical question which they seldom ask in such papers so we need to understand that it's it appears that there is a persistent doubt that the wife is having an affair although no one agrees so this shows that there is a delusion delusion of infidelity so delusion of infidelity is seen in the question
and but important to remember although it is causing sadness or distress but he is otherwise able to do all his work as before very important point in the question for helping us reach to a diagnosis so the answer in this question is option b that is delusional disorder so now let us discuss some of the important aspects of a delusional disorder now a delusional disorder is characterized by either a single delusion so there may be only one delusion or there may be a related set of delusions and which generally are persistent as in this case it was nearly for a year so normally the duration criteria as per dsm 5 duration is required for one month or more for the symptom to persist and also the criteria of schizophrenia should never have been met to make a diagnosis of delusional disorder now hallucinations they may be present but generally if they are present they are not prominent and they are generally related to the theme of the delusion or the delusional theme very important so it's not that hallucinations are always absent they may be present they may be transiently present but generally are not prominent important now according to icd10 the icd10 has given a term new term it has used a different term persistent delusional disorder also one thing different is that they have used the duration criteria that the symptom should be present for at least 3 months then only they make a diagnosis of persistent delusional disorder very very key highlighting point that although the delusion is present the functioning is not markedly impaired so the occupational or the social so the functioning so the functioning so day to day functioning of the patient it may be personal functioning or social functioning or occupational functioning so the functioning of the person is not impaired very very important unlike let us suppose patient with schizophrenia where functioning is generally affected also the behavior is not obviously bizarre or odd so to if other than the symptom if you see the patient he may be appear absolutely normal now the age of the delusional disorder generally is from the mid to the late 30s now it can be of various sub types depending on the theme of the delusion so it may be erotomanic type when the theme is that the person claims that the other person is love with in with the individual it may be grandiose type when the person may claim of having some great talent or having been made some important discovery so it may be jealousy type when his or her wife or lover is unfaithful so infidelity like it may be persecutory when someone feels that he is being conspired against spied or followed or poisoned it may be somatic type when the theme is bodily functions or sensations and it can also be mixed when no one delusional theme predominates so these are the various sub types now let us move to the next question which of the following drugs is least likely to be associated with hyperprolactinemia now such questions are very important because they are asking a lot of questions about the psychopharmacology now the options are a haloperidol b risperidone c aripiprazole and d trifluoxetine so the right answer is option c that is aripiprazole now let us discuss now we should know that there is an important relationship between dopamine and prolactin now there are four important tracts of dopamine in the brain one of them is tubular infundibular tract or the tubular infundibular dopamine pathway which runs from hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary now important to remember that dopamine controls the prolactin secretion very important to remember this concept and generally how it controls dopamine basically inhibits the release of prolactin so we know that when we use antipsychotics so when we use antipsychotics it may be first generation antipsychotics or second generation antipsychotics both of which inhibit dopamine or both of them are d2 blockers we also know that first generation are only dopamine blockers while second generation blocks dopamine as well as serotonin receptor important so when the person is using antipsychotics so because of inhibition of dopamine in the tuberoinfundibular pathway 
there is a decrease in dopamine on patients with antipsychotic so subsequently this will increase the prolactin so a patient on antipsychotics may have a raised prolactin so what are the symptoms of hyperprolactinemia so it may be sexual dysfunctions that include decrease of libido that may be one of the symptoms can be seen in both males and females there may be menstrual dysfunctions especially amenorrhea maybe one of the symptoms cessation of menses again galactoria again these two symptoms are also very prominent so there may be secretion of galactoria is secretion of milk so the patient may present with such symptoms which are due to hyperprolactinemia now we know that it is more common with the first generation antipsychotics than the second generation antipsychotics but both of the group of antipsychotics can lead to hyperprolactinemia now let us discuss some of the important drugs especially the second generation antipsychotics which are prolactin sparing so they are prolactin sparing especially that is they increase in prolactin is very rare they very rarely increase prolactin so very important list one of the important drugs is very important to remember eripiprazole then acenapine now two of the important relatively newer drugs brexpiprazole and keriprazine also are prolactin sparing very important to remember clozapine then eloperidon and quetiapine so this is the list of drugs which are prolactin sparing in fact in the treatment so if a person with hyperprolactinemia presents to you one of the important thing is that you can change the antipsychotic you can change the antipsychotic to a antipsychotic which is prolactin sparing or less likely to increase prolactin then another important modality which we generally use is we add eripiprazole so low doses of eripiprazole in fact are added to treat hyperprolactinemia in a patient on antipsychotic so very important point to remember so the answer here is eripiprazole of all the options now let us move to the next question again a very important topic eating disorder again very likely that one of the questions may be from eating disorder so which of these is not associated with anorexia nervosa a binge eating b menorrhagia c restriction of calorie and d purging so the right answer to this question is option b that is menorrhagia so now let us discuss now anorexia nervosa is derived from two greek words anorexia means loss of appetite and nervosa means nervous in origin that is it is a disorder of nervous in origin now it is most commonly very important again to remember it is most commonly seen in adolescent females now but important to remember that this name is a misnomer because in the patient generally the appetite is normal no symptom of anorexia that is no symptom of anorexia is seen in anorexia nervosa but the name is anorexia nervosa most common age of onset is between 14 to 18 years so adolescent females 14 to 18 age year group is very important or most common age group of onset now what are the characteristic features of the anorexia nervosa now very very important to understand these so according to dsm so we'll discuss according to dsm 5 so important features include first that there is a disturbance of body image so person perceives that she is fat despite the person being very thin in reality so even if the person is appearing very thin to others the person still perceives herself to be fat this is very important that there is a disturbance in body image second there is excessive fear of fatness so person has a fear that i may become fat or i am fat and there is excessive emphasis on thinness that i should be thin so for this there is restriction of energy intake so the person stops taking energy food which subsequently results in less weight than normal sometimes it may be even underweight now an important update in dsm5 or change in dsm5 is that in dsm4 tr the amenorrhea was necessary symptom so it was one of the fourth symptom to make a diagnosis 
but that has been now removed in DSM-5. So now the diagnosis does not require that amenorrhea should be present although we know that patient in anorexia nervosa many of the patient have amenorrhea as well but it is now not required to make a diagnosis but in ICD-10 it still remains to be one of the criteria. Now we should also see that there are two important subtypes so there are two important subtypes of anorexia nervosa important the first is restricting type which is more common very important this is more common and this is generally characterized by highly restricted food intake or decrease in the calorie intake second and less common is binge eating and purging subtype so yes even binge eating or purging can also be seen in anorexia nervosa but we should understand that it is different from binge eating purging type in bulimia nervosa because other than this feature of binge eating purging it is also seen that anorexia nervosa patient has a distorted self image then there is excessive preoccupation with the fat gaining weight or being thinness and also restricting type or per binge eating or purging type so this is seen is around 20 to 25 percent of the patients what happens here that patient alternates between rigorous dieting with intermittent so there is an intermittent binging binging is eating excessively in a short duration which is followed by purging episodes so self-induced vomiting is there so this is another subtype so these are two important subtypes of anorexia nervosa now the next question which of the drugs in alcohol dependence acts on the NMDA receptor options are a naltrexone b baclofen c acamprosate and d phylloxetine so the answer is c acamprosate now let us discuss about acamprosate now acamprosate is a calcium salt of n-acetyl homotorneate the mechanism the proposed mechanism of action is that it is a NMDA receptor antagonist now it is one of the anti-craving agents used for alcohol and it is FDA approved for treatment of alcohol dependence. So in fact there are two important drugs which are FDA approved. First we know is acamprosate important and second we know is naltrexone. So these are two important drugs which are approved by FDA for alcohol dependence. Now important side effects include headache, diarrhea, flatulence, abdominal pain, paresthesias and skin reactions. Now important to remember that it is contraindicated in patient with severe renal impairment that is when creatinine clearance is less than 30 ml per minute very important. So so these are some of the important drugs also we to end to continue the list of drugs used then there is baclofen then ondensetron topiramate and SSRIs like fluoxetine so these are important drugs which can be used in alcohol dependence for the maintenance now but we know that acamprosate and naltrexone are the FDA approved drugs also another mechanism is which disulfiram uses so we know disulfiram is a aversion agent it inhibits aldehyde very important to remember it inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase very very important so these were the important questions so you can also join us on Facebook group Psychiatry by Dr. Ankit Goyal and please like and subscribe this YouTube channel Dr. Ankit Goyal MD Psychiatry. Thank you.